Welcome to Afterlife Mysteries. Hi, I'm Kalila Smith, and joining me today is my co-host, Billy Roberts, and we have a special guest today, and we're going to be talking about something kind of fun. We have Alan Gilbreth with us today. He is a celebrity of many different venues, television shows. He's the producer of this show. He's also a published author and radio celebrity, television celebrity. Welcome, Alan. Hello. Alan. And we are going to be talking about the healing <coughs> powers of laughter. Alan is a big fan of laughter and people do not realize, you know, um, in, in fact, I think when I messaged you, Billy, I told you what the subject was. You said, well, it's nothing paranormal, yeah. but actually it is because as mediums, Billy and I work with people who are grieving the loss of a loved one. And the purpose, of course, of the medium is to provide messages, if they come through from loved ones, to console grieving members of families that are still here, that their loved one is still with them, that their loved one is safe, and that they will be reunited, reunited with them at some point in the afterlife. We give people hope and we help the grieving. One of the things that I learned very yeah. shortly after after my daughter passed in 2013 and I, I was desperate i was i was going crazy i thought i was losing my mind because i had worked with spirits for over 25 years and i could not reach her i saw her the day after she passed she was on the edge of the bed the typical crisis apparition and then after that i couldn't reach her and it, i was in a very dark place literally on the floor, sobbing, unable to catch my breath, begging God to just take me because I could not reach her. Well, long story short, very shortly thereafter, I think that same day, I was walking down the street and somebody came out of a grocery store close to where I worked. She walked right up to me. She hands me a business card and says, this guy's a medium in Metairie. You need to call him. And this, this particular lady was a psychic in the square. And so I went, great, that's just what I needed. Thank you. And I, I contacted uh, my friend, Sid Patrick, um, and he did a reading, was able to reach her. And he's the one that pointed out to me, my problem was is that I was too deep in my grief. And even from another perspective, if you're not into the mediumship thing, my doctor even told me, I'm really afraid you're so far into grief that if you don't take breaks from it, you will have a heart attack. And I said, how do you take a break from, from grieving? And he says, even if it's for five minutes, allow yourself time to not think about it. And the only way I knew how to do that and could actually distract myself was watching old comedy television shows. And at first, like many people, I felt very guilty for laughing because something would trigger my laughter and I'd feel like, oh, you know, I shouldn't be laughing right now. But the fact of the matter is, I was so deep in my grief that I had cut off my ability to make contact with my daughter or even get any of the signs that she was sending me. Because grief is a very heavy emotion, it pulls you down and what you have to do is raise your vibration and laughter is one of the ways that you can do it. We have actually even done table tipping, physical seances, and had the table lift because instead of singing, everyone began laughing. We did a little experiment, and laughing raises your vibration. And it is proven that scientifically that laughter and positive attitudes also keep you healthier. So what do you guys think about all that? Well, in, in fact, you're talking about science. Um, science has now proven that it's to do with a neuropeptide. These are minute particles, protein, that actually are produced by the neurons in the brain. And they can cause us to be uh, elated and, um, you know, feeling good about the world when we're unhappy. But more importantly, they found out that um, persistence in laughing, when you're laughing a lot, and you make it a part of your everyday life, if you can, if it's possible, then it can actually cure serious disease. Yes. But the down part of it is, um, some scientists believe that over laughing can actually suffocate you, cause you to die. Um, I suppose it's a very rare phenomenon, but uh, laughter does take place in the brain. And listening, listening to a, a funny media, a comedian, sorry, that was a Freudian slip. Comedian. Um, there, was, there was one in Liverpool, a guy called Ken Dodd, who was uh, in his early 90s when he died. 
And he's probably the funniest man on this planet. If you've never seen him, you go to one of his shows, you'd have loved him, Alan, because one of his shows would last till one o'clock in the morning. And you'd only know the show was over when he'd go behind the curtain and his hand would come out with a milk bottle and place it on the stage, enough to say, it's over. It's enough. Go home. <laughs> go home. But he did believe, and I knew him, he was a friend of my dad's, and he believed that it, there was some kind of chemical reaction, serotonin, melatonin, and the endorphins in the brain. We've spoken about the, the endorphin, uh, the body's natural healing or natural morphine. Mm -hmm. And laughter, belly laughter, a good guffaw, will make you feel good about the world, even if you're suffering from bereavement. Yes. What do you think, Alan? Well, um, I, I'm going to go back in time a little bit of uh, many, many, many years ago, I was a technical instructor. So, and I, I taught adult classes and, you know, of course you had this, this, this very big book and you had this lovely lesson plan and of, you know, and if you got to use one of your phrases, Billy, if you got bloody minded about it, you just, you opened the book, you started the lesson plan and basically you browbeat these people for the next eight or nine hours. And at the end of it, you know, they did learn something. They did come out of the class, you know, with knowledge, but, you know, they, they staggered out of the class because they had been trying to absorb basically six weeks of college in one day. Well, that's just not my temperament of, so, you know, I walked in and for me, it was basically a trapped audience for me to try out lots of stand-up comedy material on while I had them trapped and they might accidentally learn something. And my, my favorite story from this is I was teaching a class, just, just basic computers. This was a throwaway class. I mean, this was the class no teacher wanted to teach because nobody in the class had any computer skills. So you were literally starting from scratch. That was honestly one of my faces because every 10 minutes you saw huge light bulbs go off over people's heads as you made something make sense. And I walked into the classroom and there was a gentleman there and, and I'm sure as you guys can see on the film, I'm not a small person. I'm a big guy. Khalil will look at you. Yeah, he's, 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 yeah. I'm the kind of guy that goes flips over boats and wrestles alligators and does dumb things. He does. I've seen it. Did, did, <laughs> Khalil, this guy dwarfed me. He had to be at least 6'4". I could have stood in front of him and you'd have still seen him all the way around me. And he's 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 that what would you would call that tense color he was just just he was just, and i'm like oh my goodness his knuckles were white he was already sweating he'd showed up like 30 minutes early to class and he was he honestly looked like he was gonna explode and i'm honestly sitting here thinking oh this guy's not he's not going to make it through my class this is this is bad so i walk in and i'm sitting there with him like hey i'm alan i'm gonna be your instructor glad of you to be here early dude you know what what's going on why are you taking the class and he literally starts shaking and i'm like all right it's time to confess all right let's get the if he's going to kill me let's get it over with now here we go so you know get up to the podium leaning in there with him and it finds out that he is an archaeological researcher who's been in the field for the last five years now keep in mind this is like the year 2000 so computer skills were still not every day we didn't have smartphones and stuff then so he he's freaking out he goes he, he, he's, he's he's almost crying and he looks at me and he goes I've been sending in my field notes for the last five years. And I go into the office finally a week ago to get them. 
and he reaches in his pocket. And I even found one so I could hold it up. He reaches in his pocket and he pulls out one of these. Now, for those of you that use computers today, this was an old jump drive. <laughs> this is a three and a half inch floppy drive. And five years of his life was now on this thing. And he didn't know what it was. Oh my God. He'd never used one. He'd never typed. Everything he'd done had been handwritten. He was freaking out. So I'm like, dude, I tell you what, calm down. Give me the disc. Just give me the disc. And I put it in my, my instructor's computer. And I reached over and I got about four floppy disks of my own. And I made him about four copies of that disc. And then showed him on his computer. This is all before class, right? <laughs> all before class. And and he, he's and I showed him how to access the file, and they had put it in a in a program called Word. And there all of his files were. There was five years of his work, all beautiful. And he now had five copies of it. So in case something happened. The look of absolute relief on this man's face. He class is just beginning, right? People are just wandering into the room, and here is this giant of a man collapsing into a chair. His shoulders just collapse, and his head is over to one side, and he looks like I just punched him out. And it was all of that tension from the last week draining out of him and then once class got going he really didn't participate for the first segment and i think it's because his body was rebooting because <laughs> then we take a break and we come back and i look at him like you know dude are you okay really are you, are you? he goes you have no idea and the smile that came over his face <laughs> and i mean this is just one of those really intense memories I have of the relief of, of this amazingly simple problem to me. To me, there was no problem. But to him, this was five years of his life, this massive, insurmountable problem was now removed. And he grinned and smiled and giggled and cut up. He was almost a disruption to class the rest of the day. Cause he was putting the disc in and he was playing with the disc and he was clicking on stuff and it would come up on the screen. And every time it would come up on the screen, he was just like, he was like, like a little kid discovering his toes. And, and watching this experience, you know, I, while we're talking about, you know, while I am professionally a, a very virulent skeptic, you're watching, if, not, if nothing else, an emotional experience. But I promise you this man was having a spiritual experience. Because he went from, my life is over, I'm dead, to this whole new world in about 30 minutes. So just watching him uplift like that was utterly and completely amazing. I'll do one more story and I'm going to kick it back to y'all because it's the opposite effect. I'm teaching a class in something called Excel, which is just a spreadsheet, right? And I have my beginning Excel class and everybody in there is trying to figure out what the stupid cells are and how to write a formula and all these little things. And if you've never seen this before, you have no point of reference. You have no way of knowing anything about this. And we, and I promised the class, I would show them something called three dimensional programming by the end of the day. Cause that's like the big thing, right? This is the whole reason you learn this software. Kalila is dying laughing because she lives in this software. <laughs> And, and she knows what I. She knows how the story is going to end, and she already knows. I haven't even told her the story. She does not need to be a psychic. She knows the ending of this story. So we go through the whole day, 
And my my class is hard, it's fast, and it's a whole lot of magic tricks. It's like, okay, ladies and gentlemen, let that mouse go. All right, hold your fingers up at no point in time. Are we going to blah, 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 blah. A whole very fast, you know, very fast routine. You've seen it on TV. A million comedians use it. And But I would get them, all right, wait, wait, wait. Now click the button. And, you know, look, computers can do that. So everybody goes through this whole routine all day. We get done about 20 minutes early. And I'm like, okay, guys. We spent all day building this fake company. We built an entire year's worth of data. And I've told y'all to do things a certain way. And this is why. We're going to make the 13th month. So here we go. So I'm telling everybody how to do it. And we write the first formula. And it's, it's a long formula. The class is completely confused. They have no idea what this formula is going to do. We get to the end of it, and I'm like, all right, everybody, wait for it. Wait for it. All right, we're ready. We're ready. We're ready. Click the button. They click it, and I swear to you, I have seen a woman become possessed. Her voice changed. It was like a Linda Blair moment. She actually stands up at her desk and grips the side of it. Because what we had done was write a formula that would go get all of this data from all of these different worksheets and put it in a final year-end category. So here was your year-end summation. And she goes, you mean to tell me I just spent the last eight weeks of my life doing this manually? And I'm like, well, yeah. But I said, now... Do you know the Scotty theorem of how to bid a job? And she looked at me funny. I said, all right, everybody at your work knows it takes eight weeks to do the weekend, to do the year end wrap up, right? Because it took eight weeks this time, right? Everybody knows that. She goes, well, yeah, everybody knows that. And I said, okay, did you ever see Scotty on Star Trek? <laughs> Captain Kirk, every episode would yell at Scotty, I need my engines. And Scotty would come back and say, they're offline. It'll take me six hours. Kirk would scream at him, you have an hour. And Scotty would go, yeah, all right, whatever. <laughs> and then he would save the day, right? Well, finally, one of the movies, Kirk looks at Scotty and goes, you know, Scotty, do you always, always multiply your estimates by a factor of four? And Scotty goes, I, Captain, also going to maintain my reputation as a communicable worker. <laughs> And I said, ah, your boss has not taken this class. He does not know it's going to take you an hour to do this next year. He thinks it takes eight weeks. I said, that's a lot of shopping you can get in. That's a lot of long lunches, eight weeks. So I, I have seen people's laughter and joy erupt from having an obstacle removed from their life. And, you know, I'm, I'm in the computer business, so I see people tortured by technology all the time. And when you, when you show them that the beast is now your friend, or at least not your enemy, the relief, the joy that comes back into these people. And I, I found that life is not so much you know, the life's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is that mostly life and work is the drama and trauma of it. The trick is finding what relieves that. And I don't know if that makes you happy or not, but it certainly doesn't tick you off. Oh, so, you know, so I'm going to let you guys weigh in. What happened to these people at that moment when suddenly we broke that servitude to the computer i'm gonna tag out to y'all now and go get them because what what happened inside these people's minds at this moment well okay first off did they start laughing as a as a release would be my question the, the, the smiles they look like the joker i mean they're they're grinning like they haven't grinned in years so, you know, here's the, the joy and the laughter and the, the OMG. You can actually see the letters in the air above their heads that 
this pain in my life has now been removed. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. You know, when I was in school, when I was studying to be a body worker and studying naturopathic medicine uh, and Chinese medicine, um, it, one of the first stories I was told was about a recent study. Now this is, you know, you know 25 years ago. And, and at that time there had recently been a study and I believe it was at Tulane University where they took two groups of actors and they did this controlled experiment. They took two groups of actors and they told one group to pretend that they were happy, act happy. Not necessarily have to be happy, but act happy. How does one act when one is happy? And then they told the other group, act depressed. So we don't know if anybody was really depressed, but nonetheless, they took blood samples from both groups of all the actors. And what they found was that the group who acted depressed, the cells that they had, they could actually see that the cell walls were thinner than the group who acted happy. So it doesn't necessarily mean you have to watch something funny and be in hysterical laughter, but just by being happy, and of course laughter makes us happy, if you can start seeing the lighter side of things, if you can start, if you can laugh at yourself, if you can laugh at some of the situations that might stretch you out and just be a little more lighter about it and laugh about it, it would relieve a lot of uh, problems that people have. But they literally prove scientifically that depression and the negative feelings did weaken the cells, the cell lining, which of course weakens the immune system. What do you think, Billy? I was just thinking about um, depression. Uh, I've spoken to a lot of um, psychiatric nurses and they all agree that depression is um, contagious. If you work in a, a depressed atmosphere, you end up being depressed. And it's the same with, with happiness and laughter. If you're miserable, if you're unhappy, and you, you are in a, a happy environment with people who are happy, first of all, they, they, they annoy you because they're happy and you're not. But if you're there, <laughs> true, and if you're there long enough, then you'll find that their happiness will transfer to you. You might not know why you're happy, why you're feeling this, what they feel. You might not know it, but you do feel it. So, and that proves the point really, that it is contagious and there is some kind of chemical transference from them to you. You, you can't see it, but you can certainly feel it. And I, I've seen this occur in many different cases, people who are suffering bereavement and you take them into see a, a comedian that's quite funny or you take them into a show that's full of humor. And by the end of the show, you'll see a change in their demeanor, the way they look different, they behave differently. So we know, and scientists do know, that happiness and laughter is good for your health. Uh, that's what I think. Yeah, and a lot of people who are in, who are grieving loved ones, and there's they're seeking mediums to get information because the reason they come to a medium is they're not getting any communication themselves they're they're not you know i've asked for signs i don't get signs i don't i you know they don't try they're not reaching out well many times as a medium and i know billy has had the same thing happen where you've got this communication coming in from the person on the other side saying i keep trying to get their attention and they're not listening they're not they're just ignoring it and what's happening is you have this going on because the spirit world is vibrating at a much higher vibration, right? And everything in the universe is vibration. You've got your lower emotions, which are lower vibrations, and then you got your higher emotions. So in order to connect, what a medium does is it kind of has to raise their vibration rate to communicate with the other side. And in turn, the other side has to kind of come down a little bit to, to make that connection. But when these people can start laughing, and the biggest hindrance, and what was the hardest part for me anyway, was feeling guilty. And uh, we recently had, had a, a person in our family pass away, and the daughter made a comment to me. I feel guilty if something good happens and, I, and, I'm, and I'm happy about it. I feel like I shouldn't be happy. And I said, no, actually, that is what she would have wanted. She would want you to be happy. Yeah. She would not, well, she was not the kind of person who would want 
everybody boohooing over her being gone. She would appreciate and does appreciate when you can be happy and she would want nothing but you to be happy. And that's a lot of things that people don't really grip because we're so conditioned by social stigmas of you have to be in a mourning period for so long and it's not okay to laugh and it's not okay to be happy and and, and that's disrespectful and it's really not our, our loved ones would not want us to be unhappy to the point that we're making ourselves sick and that's basically what happens there have been cases and you hear about you know dying from a broken heart and it actually is a real medical condition yeah. You know, intense grief can actually damage your heart. If you look at that from a Chinese medicine perspective, you know, you're looking at the emotion that's out there, you know, as above, so below. You look at the emotion that's out there, grief, which is going to affect, you know, the heart and the pericardium meridians. And eventually it's going to make its way to that organ level. And you can literally cause yourself to, to have a heart attack and literally die from a broken heart. Right. And the, the other thing is, uh, there's a, there is a, a phenomenon, a sick kind of humor, where people find um, something, you know, some kind of malady, some something somebody's going through that's not funny at all, but you tend to find a humorous. You know what I mean? Oh, I, I know, it, I know people like that, yeah. and I think that's a a, a, a a deflection kind of thing. Some people have a hard time dealing with um bad news or dealing i think it's a relief of some kind to uh kind of deflect having to deal with the actual situation i mean from a psychological point what do you think billy i, I think some people do tend to find uh other people's uh misfortune quite humorous funny but i've done it myself you, you find it difficult you, you fight i've fought it and I think, well, it's quite funny, this. Um, and the person might be sobbing their eyes out in front of you. And I, I'm fighting uh, some kind of laughter. And it's only when you go away and you think, well, it wasn't really funny, but it was to me. So does, that, <laughs> does that make me um, something wrong with me? Uh, and so I, I'm a giggler, you know, and it is infectious. If you're amongst a load of people and you, you get the giggle, very difficult to stop when she stops. It is. And, you know, laughter is an essential part of our development. And I don't know where we'd be as a human being if we didn't have laughter. And you know, that's what comedians are all about, making you laugh. So they make you laugh for a reason. And it's very difficult, even when you go to a show and, you know, you, you've had a, a terrible week. You might have lost somebody close to you, but your friends pull you along to a uh, show to pull you out of the doldrum. And um, at the end of the night, you think, well, you know, I'm miserable. Why have I been laughing? And sometimes it makes you feel guilty that you've laughed all night when you, sh you think you shouldn't be laughing. So, so laughter is essential, I think. There's a psychology behind it. And they, they know now it's a scientific fact, and it is a, a pain relief. You know, if you if you got toothache or an abscess somewhere, if you're in a, a very humorous environment, you forget the pain. It overrides it, and um, so laugh is essential. I think. Absolutely. I mean, think about look at the faces. I mean, we've all seen. I mean, Billy, you've probably done it directly and maybe you have to alan you know where they bring sick people or elderly people they bring the animals in to 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 see them and yeah. and you know for healing from the animals and just that visit and in fact there's a commercial <coughs> right now where the little girls in the hospital and they said we're going to try something different and they bring in a dog and immediately she's mm -hmm. laughing she's holding the dog i mean it does yeah it's hard to play <coughs> with a dog or a cat and not get into a happy mood and start yeah. it elevates us it absolutely elevates us and it doesn't just elevate our mood it elevates everything down to a cellular level all the way across the board yeah and, I, I, and that's beneficial on you know in so many different ways well i i think you're also adding in that uh your mood also greatly affects your powers of observation 
and your ability to make a decision. Of, I, I, you know, it's it's of, yeah. I'm I'm going to step over onto y'all's territory slightly and kind of go, you know, there, there's there's people that will come to you and tell you, you know, I'm cursed. You know, I I just nothing goes right for me. Nothing nothing goes right. Nothing goes right. Nothing goes right. And, you know, I'm kind of of the opinion, I'm a little bit like Yoda, you know, it's like the do, you know, there is no try, do it or do not. Of, uh, I, I am sure that y'all definitely deal with people in a mental state that are perpetuating that mental state by, I, you know, I'll, I'll be, I'll sound a little goofy and say by not letting humor, not letting a little light into their life. And, and I, I see this a lot, you know, I work with uh, medical facilities, skilled nursing facilities and like that. And you see a lot of families that are, uh, they're persistently gloom and doom. And, and it seems to, it seems to carry because I, I think once you get the, the, the gloomy, terrible outlook on life, that then the decisions you're making seem to perpetuate that. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. And it also becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, you know, you, you attract what you're emitting out, you, you know, okay. you all attract, you know, on an energetic level, the energy you're putting out, the thought forms are yeah. going to make their way back to you and manifest on the physical plane. So if you're putting out nothing but doom and gloom, and you're not putting out anything positive, doom and gloom is going to come back to you. And oftentimes that people don't even recognize it because it's out there in the universe floating around as a thought form. It finally comes back. You don't even recognize it as your own. And then you have people who say, why does this always happen to me? And they don't realize that they are creating it. And, you know, uh, years and years ago, I did a little experiment myself because when I first started working in the French Quarter, you know, I mean, here I am from the outskirts of the bayous, you know, going down to work in the busy French Quarter where there's nowhere to park. You know, sometimes you're parking, you know, a mile away and you got to walk in and it's like, you know, and I started saying all the time, oh gosh, every time I come down here, I can't, I can't find a place to park. Every time I come down here, I have to park so far away and walk so far in. It's so, it's so horrible. And, you know, this was right about the time that I started taking classes over at one of the local, um, you know, esoteric shops in the French Quarter. And um, somebody said, well, we'll start saying that every time you come to the French Quarter, you do find a place. And I said, oh, that's going to be a little hard, but okay, now I'll start doing it. I will start doing it. And as soon as I called in, I would say out loud, every time I come down here, I find the perfect parking place exactly where I need to be. Now, it didn't happen right away. Didn't happen right away, but I didn't let it stop me. It was like, I'm going to keep saying this. Every time I come down here, I find the perfect place to park. Right where I need to be. And sooner or later, it started happening. And then it happened. It's been happening. I mean, I haven't been down there in over a year because of COVID, but it happened for like 20 years. It started. And every time I would go down there, I'd say like, okay, now, you know, got to remember I'm going to have to find the perfect parking space right where I need to be. And then I would say, and if I can't find it, if I circle the block three times, someone will move and I will get their parking space. And it started happening. And it's because <laughs> I was putting out that energy and somehow it would always work in my favor. <laughs> and I would start parking exactly in front of where I needed to be without fail. And I did this for 20 years. And, you know, you can truly, you know, people, people will start believing something, you know, beliefs are stronger than anything, anything more than desires or intentions or anything like that. And if you truly believe that you're cursed, then of course you create cursed conditions. You know, the only curses come from you. There is an ancient precept, um, thoughts crystallize into habit and habit solidifies into circumstances. And before we can change our circumstances, we have to learn to change the way we think. Because we're constantly peopling our own <clears throat> private of space with the thoughts we release. Now, there is the law of attraction, but there's a, a video on YouTube 
and it's a, it's a little, I think he's about nine years old, this boy, he's a little Asian boy. And it's what do you practice? He sits on a team and he doesn't have a script. And he'll say, what do you practice? Do you practice whinging? Do you practice complaining? <laughs> Whatever you practice, you'll get good at. Do you practice love? Do you practice compassion? Because if you do, you'll get good at it. Or do you complain even about the buffalo you don't have? And I thought it was really funny. And complain about the, the person sitting in the seat on the plane opposite you. Do you complain to yourself that that's the seat you wanted and you should have had? And, you know, we are complainers. And we complain about little things. We mightn't voice our complaints. As Alan said, you know, we, we, it's, it's nice to have a, a jovial at, uh, attitude to things. But when, you, you have, when you've had a lot of problems or you've been through difficult times, it is difficult, extremely difficult, to put on a, a different persona and say, you know, I'm happy. Because people who know you well know that you're not happy. They can see right through it. But if you associate with the right people, <laughs> that something will transpire in you and you can transform the way you think. And it's as you've said, Kalila, it's a matter of attitude and it's a matter of what you believe and how you apply yourself to life. You can either sit down and whinge for the rest of your life or you can get up and join the band, so to speak, and be happy. That's true. That's very, very true. I mean, and, and there are some, you know, from a, from really from like a medical <clears throat> perspective, when you get that deep belly laugh, I mean, laughter is oh, yeah. directly, it's directly connected to the breath. So, you know, for people who are not familiar with meditation and not familiar with, you know, pranayama and, and, and deep breathing exercises, if you start really laughing that it forces you to take those deep breaths it forces you to 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 get more oxygen into your system it forces you to also exhale a lot of that toxins that are in your body and so forth so it really does have um you know a physical effect and alan yeah you can also tell by a person's uh, face whether they're happy or not and what kind of character they have you you look happy alan to me you look at a person who is accepting, you know, philosophical about life. And, and so do you, even though I know that you do have issues sometimes, you know, health-wise. But it's very difficult, isn't it, to hide the way you are as an individual, whether you're happy or sad. And sometimes don't you feel guilty being happy when you're with people who are not happy? It's as though you... you, you I shouldn't be happy because they're not happy. No, but, I don't well, feel like that anymore. I, I, I really yeah. have conditioned myself where I don't feel guilty for other people. I feel like, you know, if I'm happy, hey, you know what? Um, you know, maybe it's my job to try to convince them that they need to be happier, you know, maybe try to spread the joy or something. But, um, you know, the only time I have felt guilty is in the case of, of when there was a death and, and, and I shouldn't feel happy. I should wait to feel happy because I should be if if I'm mourning, therefore I'm showing that person how much they're missed, and yeah. um, I've learned that that's not that's not helpful to the person grieving. It's certainly not helpful to the person on the other side because that's not what they want to see. They don't want you to be unhappy, and it's not helpful to the other people who are grieving around because it just grief generates <clears throat> grief, and sometimes can lead to long term, you know, what they call complicated grief, you know, and depression. So yeah. it's it's just not it's not good. It's not healthy. I don't know whether you've ever watched The Sopranos. Um, <laughs> I, I haven't. No, I, I don't really watch TV a whole lot. But no. I think I've worked for them a couple of times. You know. <laughs> the funniest, funniest episode my wife and I have ever seen. What one of the you know they kill a lot of people, don't they? He went to a, a, a medium. A medium uh, went to a spiritualist church, one of the gangsters. Mm -hmm. and the medium was very calm and uh, went to him, picked him out of the, the congregation to give him a message. But unfortunately, 
he gave him messages from all the people he'd murdered, all the people <laughs> he killed. And he jumped up and he battered. He beat the medium up. <laughs> he thought somebody had given him all the information. <laughs> and I thought it was so, so funny. Because as a medium, you never know who you're speaking to. That's right. You never know the audience. But I thought that was so funny. And even thinking about it now brings some kind of uh, humor to it. I, I think it's hilarious. <laughs> it is. That is very funny. Yeah, so, so the trick is, if you're a mafia hitman, do not hang out with psychics. There you go. Yeah, yeah. If the jenny, that is. If the yep, not a good idea. Totally not a good idea. But we are but the... Yeah, is, go ahead. We are, we were going to say, we're the architect of our own destiny by the way that we think. And it's very difficult to change the way you've become accustomed to thinking. Now, I think our parents... I've got a lot to do with this because from a very, very early age, they program us um, <coughs> and, <coughs> and sometimes, you know, depending on what parents you've got, you might have uh, parents who are very philosophical about life and good grounded parents and give you the right direction. But more often than not, you might have parents who are not interested in your life in the future and program you in the wrong way. And, so the onus is on us to reprogram ourselves. I'm talking about me in, in my life and in the way I was as a kid. But I think you have to have something in you. Um, I can't remember my dad having um, a good sense of humor. I think my mother was German and uh, my dad was Jewish. So that didn't go well, did it? Very Jewish and German. But I think also... Um, Humor, I think humor is in some people and not in others. I, I was saying, I, I picked you out, Alan, because I think you've got a humorous face. You've got a happy face. You've got a happy eye. You can tell it by the mouth and the body language as well that you, you're not a fool. You, you know, you know what, what you want from life. And I think yeah, as a matter of interest, what's your date of birth? Uh, me, Abraham Lincoln, and Charles Darwin all got saddled with February 12th. Oh, so you're an Aquarian. Aquarian. Oh, yes. Aquarians are very ambitious people normally. They, they can be quite materialistic. But you're numerically influenced by the sign of Pisces. And that's your controlling part of your life. You know, the, these two astrological forces make you quite strong. Obviously, you do um, martial arts. But other, other, you've been through a, a lot in your life, certainly uh, when you were younger. And I think it comes out in your life now because it's in your face. Your face is a, a database. It tells me everything about you. And <laughs> you're a decent human being. Gemini, you're a Gemini. They're the proverbial yes. ditherers. They can't make decisions quick enough. But you're not exactly like that. What, what's your date? June 21st, I'm on the cusp of cancer. Yes, you're, you're numerically influenced by the sun of Pisces. <laughs> so you both enter new cycles in uh, March this year. So this should be a good year for you, for you I both. I so. <laughs> really <laughs> hope so. <laughs> now, when we you all start, hope so. <laughs> I mean, the reason I did that, because, you know, it's a party piece, isn't it? When you start to talk, even people who are not interested in uh, this kind of stuff, when you start to talk about their life and their future, then they change. There's something that changes in them. They become very attentive and, and listen to what you're saying. But a medium has a responsibility. We have a responsibility because we control things. And some people are very vulnerable, <clears throat> not vulnerable. He's got a bad cough, but it's not COVID, but he's not vulnerable. But you are. You're vulnerable. And you hide it very, very well. Because you've got this facade you've taken probably years to create. I'm certainly vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> so Aren't last we thing, all? I don't think so, no. I've known people who are not vulnerable 
people who just manipulate circumstances, oh, control right. circumstances. I mean, I am, I'm a, I'm a Cancerian, and I rely a lot on my wife, Dolly, because she's a Libra. <laughs> You're an air sign, she's an air sign. And air signs are very creative people. They tend to like to take control of things. You know, they, they can't be cajoled. You can't tell him what to do. You're an air sign as well. So, but you can be controlled. And that's the problem why you've reached this part in your life, why you're, you're, you're thinking um, probably negative thoughts sometimes, and why you're a bit despondent at times. But I think the best is yet to come for you, and certainly for you, because I'd be very surprised if Alan didn't live into his early 90s. I'd be very surprised. There you go, Alan. Yeah. I would be shocked as well. <laughs> the thought of me being this much trouble to that many people for that long is very funny. Yes, it is. It really I figured is. somebody would shoot me before then. So we, you know. Yeah. I think if you were going to get shot, it would have happened already. No, no, you're, you're good. You're good. Yeah, I'm getting I'm getting a little <laughs> old for the getting shot in the part of the park. Yeah, you're coming yeah. into the home stretch in a few years, so you're good. <laughs> but you know, I, I'm sorry. I mean, you know, Billy, upon my death, it's probably gonna involve the words, where's Alan? What has he got? Or for the love of God, Alan, put that down. <laughs> you know, that yeah. And Khalila will probably be there, is the problem. So <laughs> Yes, there'll definitely be a Where's Alan at that point. <laughs> I'm, always I'm always reminded, you know, because I'm a medium, people will say, are you afraid of dying? And I, I say, yeah, of course I'm afraid of dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Woody Allen said, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, only a fool will be not afraid of dying. No one wants to go. We're all we're all a little afraid of what's the unknown, and even though we are mediums, we we don't really know. We, none of us knows until we get there. So, yeah, you know. But I think it's promising. I, I definitely think it's promising. Yeah. <laughs> so we are getting getting down to the to the to the to the line here, guys. We're running out of time. So, Billy, <laughs> let's hear about those books you got, because you got a lot of books out here about the afterlife. And um, Billy can be found on Amazon. Uh, he's got oh an author's page, Billy Roberts. And yeah. he's got. So which books do you books. have? What's your latest books? The, the, la the last one is, um, is Ghostly Tales and also Self-Healing with the Holistic Way. I mean, incidentally, Dolly's got two chapters in there of energy wow. recipes. She does cook, cooking. She creates these energy recipes, which are very interesting. But Kalila and I have got a couple of books coming out. Uh, yes. probably next to year. be announced, hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully to be announced. And my books, I've got a few books, not as many as this guy right here, but I've got some books, and they can be found on my website at kalilasmith.com. And very, very soon we are going to have the television shows like this one posted on there as well because I have this television show, Afterlife Mysteries, and we also have Scary Stories with Kalila. So uh, both of those are going to be posted on there as well. Getting That's on the to-do list <laughs> this week to get that put up there. But that's how you reach me. You can always friend me at Facebook. Kalila1 is the name. Facebook.com slash Kalila1. And um, of course, Alan. Go ahead, Alan. Let them know where they can find you because you are just all over the place. <laughs> um, yeah, I am kind of all over the media these days. I always find it very funny, Billy, that, you know, when I was young and beautiful and had a head full of hair, nobody <laughs> wanted to put me on camera. When you get old, lumpy, and bald, and everybody wants to see me. I, I don't know. <laughs> it, it, it's the, the humor of the world. Of um, the, the easiest thing to do is uh, you can pop over to geekysidetv.com or Roku or Fire Stick or Apple TV, and you can find, uh, well, basically all of the TV shows I'm involved in right there. Including this one. 
Including this one. He is the producer, so. Yeah. <laughs> and the director. He's, he's the guy behind the curtain, usually. Yeah. So, uh, yes, definitely. But uh, I want to thank you guys. Thank you, Alan, for joining us, because it was a pleasure having you on the oh, camera this you. time instead of behind the curtain. Billy, it's always a pleasure to, to work with you. Always an honor. And um, thank you all for tuning in and watching another episode of Afterlife Mysteries. And we hope you will join us again next time. Have a wonderful day, folks. Thank you.